You can't stack big bucks. You can grow and mature them, but your farm can only hold so many big bucks. <laughs> Be very leery because the more hunters you stack against you, the less likely you are to consistently shoot big whitetails on that farm. My favorite place is a pinch point where you're kind of in the timber or you're right on the edge of a food plot. He will work his entire home range area during the rut. What's up guys? Welcome back to the uh, Barstool Outdoors podcast that we have yet to name still. We'll figure that out. But Tim and I are back in the pod and it is November 10th, the rut. Yes. Here in Illinois and actually all over the Midwest. So this past week, these past two weeks actually have been super eventful for us. We have been hunting our honeys off. I've been traveling a lot. You've mainly been down here at the farm. This is our favorite time of the year because we're hitting the rattle. We have friends in town, all chasing bucks all over you gotta Illinois. You got to quit saying hitting the rattle. You got to say hitting the horns. Well, that the horns, means rattle. Well, they're not horn, they're not horns. Well, hit the antlers, hit the rattle. You always like I just hit the rattle. No, you hit the you hit the antlers. you hit the horns. Okay, fine. I hit the antler, hitting okay. the antlers, <laughs> making the rattle. I like to say rattle because whatever. Whatever we're doing. So we did hit the horns this week, and it worked, didn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, this is the craziest November of my life. We, I'm tagged out in Illinois, which has never happened this early. I've only tagged out in Illinois once in my life. That was last year, and now this year I've tagged out the first week of November. Yeah. Which is very exciting, but also kind of sad. You come back from Atlanta. You had a month. You dedicated a month to the hunting with me, and then uh, in four days you were. <laughs> Packing up, heading for Missouri tomorrow. So, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. So uh, we've been posting all over social media kind of what we've been doing. Everybody always wants to know, does, rat does rattling work? Hitting the antlers actually work? Uh, yes, absolutely. I rattled both of my bucks in, um, which it, they both happened so fast. The first time I rattled one in, Jack was behind the camera. This is the first time somebody's filmed besides my dad. Yeah. Which was crazy. This is the first time Jack's from the big buck ever um, come in and get slocked. So that was really cool. But we, uh, yeah, yes, the, hitting the antlers together works. It's all about rhythm. I've learned over the years. Rhythm. I, it's all about the rhythm. And, you know, the best way to uh, visualize what's happening in the woods with two big bucks fighting is that's, that's kind of what you want to do while you're cr cranking the horns together. Because if you're just randomly hitting your horns and shaking them and rattling them together, uh, it's not going to be as effective as the proper rhythm. And as Sydney has found that out over the years, that you know once you kind of get the feel for it, it works. But if you don't, sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and also our key that we always say, our hidden key is... The bigger the antlers, the more luck you're going to have. So the heavier the rack, it's going to sound like two big bucks fighting and not Tweedledee, Tweedledum out there. Yeah. Big Louis are getting yeah. after it. I believe that, uh, you know, this is kind of a theory, but I believe that these deer, uh, you know, they hear so much uh, sparring and fighting in the timber, they can pretty much identify who's fighting and what caliber of animal is fighting. And so... If you, if you give them a, uh, a sound that resembles a deer that uh, can be a dominant buck, you know, that's going to uh, initiate another mature buck to say, hey, this is uh, definitely a contender and he's in my country. I'm going to go check him out. If nothing else, I'm going to sneak in there to see who it is because those are, uh, that's, you know, and we're hunting big mature deer. Now, all the others will come to look a lot of time, but the... Uh, the big boys that want to fight or uh, are serious about it, you know, those are the ones that we want to kill. So you've got to give them something that sounds like it's in competition with them. Because when you smack a couple hundred inch, uh, you know, a pair of hundred inch antlers together, you're not going to get the the return on them like you will with, uh, you know, a good set of 150 inch antlers. I've seen a lot of people too do this. I've never done it. I kind of want to try it out. Or is they tie a rope and they put like a milk jug or something full of leaves and they're hitting it off the it's ground. It's not a milk jug though, because that would be that that sounds kind of odd, you know. What the what do they do? Plastic hollowness. You couldn't do that. You know, the great way to do it is you just hang. You can hang antlers, two antlers. I've used them on the ground. They clink a little bit and they crush the leaves. Uh, 
JP's buddy swears by a just a trash bag full of leaves so that it's a leaf sound right you know like deer running around but the best thing I ever used and when I've hunted is I had a five pound dumbbell on a on a rope and I could and you you made that kathump 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 and you just flip it around and it breaks twigs and everything and that works good. Will Primos once told me, he said, my best sound effect is throwing acorns down on the ground. So, you know, everybody's got their own tricks, yeah. but deer listen and they, they use all of their senses and maybe perhaps one sense that we don't have to, you know, find the predators as well as find, you know, their rivals or who they're going to mate with. And uh, if you can use them all to your advantage, man, you're going to slock a big buck once in a while that you wouldn't have got otherwise. Yeah. Well, and, and now we don't do any of that. We just hit the antlers together, but, um, people are asking also my DMS, like, does it matter when you hit your antlers is it the morning or the evening, which is better. Mm -hmm. I killed my deer. The first one I did, I brought a little man. He came in in the morning. And then the second shot was the evening. So yeah. it worked both. Right. But one thing that I learned from him too, and as I learned to you know, hit the antlers together and trial and error, we usually do it right with first light. So right when we're sitting in the stand, we get comfortable about 10, 15 minutes go by because we did just make a lot of noise coming into yes. the stand. So let everything quiet back down, hit the antlers together when the sun's starting to rise. And then what you usually say, 30 minutes after that when the sun's completely That's up. That's right. Most of the, in the Midwest, most of the big bucks that we've shot over the years, you know, weren't there in our lap two minutes after we rattled. They show up 10, 15 minutes later. But this year you had one that came right in, you know, right after the hit. Come here, Jack. Come up and see us, old boy. Give me a hug now. Oh, thank you so much. No more kisses though. No kisses. Okay. So anyway, yeah, the big, big boys, they like to sneak in, you know. Uh, with their ears back or, you know, sometimes you would be amazed, uh, uh, you know, if you're not accustomed to rattling in the Midwest, how far away you can uh, pull a big buck. And uh, I've by chance seen deer in the distance that were ridges over. When you crack them horns together, they stand there and look for a minute. And then next thing you know, they start stiff legging and laying their ears back and it may take them 15, 20 minutes to arrive. And they know exactly where you That's where right. you fought. That's that. why I like to add a little, you know, and you do as well. We snort wheeze, and that the the snort wheeze call is probably, uh, you know, ranks up there with the number two most provocative sound you can make in the forest to draw big bucks in close. And uh, you know, if you mix the two together and your timing's right, uh, there's no reason why you can't kill kill a big buck with it. But if you're hunting public ground or you're limited to the space that you can hunt, Sydney and I are fortunate enough to have uh, six different farms that we hunt. So in six farms and a couple of them are big farms, you know, we have the luxury of hitting the horns in places that these deer have not heard that before. Mm -hmm. If we went to public property, you know, chances are they've heard rattling before. And if you're not a, a savvy hunter, uh, and you don't play the wind right, if you're rattling you know, upwind of a bedding area that's a quarter mile away or whatever, these deer are gonna smell you and train themselves real quick to rattling. So, you know, everything is, uh, you know, it's to, it's, it comes down to the statistics of where you're hunting, you know, how many other people have been in there, what's the odds of a mature buck being in the area and so on and so forth, so. Yeah, so we've had luck with rattling. Um, and like, as I said, I'm tagged out, so, that was pretty exciting as well. You weren't with me either time. I had two different camera guys in the stand with me, which was fun to experience. Jack got to film and then our buddy Steve. Steve films, he's like a jack of all trades. He's retired actually from the prison, yeah. but he loves to hunt and he's a good hunter too. And he's, he's a good cameraman. He's a really good cameraman. Yeah. And he's that filmed. first buck that uh, he filmed was a warrior that you brought in there. That, that buck was pretty cool. He, he was a deer that we've seen for several years. Sydney actually passed him the year before, but this time he was big and mature. We could tell by the trail cam shots of him, he was a dandy. And uh, that's a good example. You know, Sydney hit the horns uh, that morning and it took him a while, but boom, he was on you, on you right underneath your tree stand. Isn't it amazing how you hit the horns 
Uh, they may come from quite a ways away, but when they get to the tree stand, they stop and look around. It's like they know right where you're at. Yeah, 100. percent It was it was kind of exciting. I I heard, and the thing is, they just pop out when during the rut. During the rut, you never know when they're gonna pop out or run and run by you. And you don't even have a shot. And what happened is, you know, I heard something to my left, and I was like, "There's something coming. I have no idea what it's gonna be." 40 yards, 35 yards, he pops out. He pops out of a thick brush, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a shooter just looked at his body. And I saw his, his rack too. I'm like, that's a big deer, but mainly his body. Yeah. I'm like, that's a yeah. big, mature buck. And I had no time to really like get ready. I hit my cameraman. I was like, oh my gosh, big buck, big buck. I turned. You're going to see in the footage. It's a rat race a little bit. It's a rat race, but that's okay. You know, what I mean? that's like how it actually goes. And... The one thing that I, you know, I'm gonna say, like I hunt a lot. Again, you know, I'm I'm still learning. I'm young, but I kind of screwed up this year a li little bit. I didn't stop either of my bucks. I think it was just like I hit the antlers. It happened so fast. I'm getting the cameraman's um, attention. I'm getting all squared up. Pull back my bow, and both times, you know, it was it was a close shot, and they were they weren't running. You know, they weren't jogging. They were slowly walking. But that's the one thing I knew internally after I shot, I should have stopped them and said, meh. So they at least froze where I, before I squeezed the trigger. Yeah. It was all, you know, as a deer hunter, you kind of are like, sometimes it just happens like that. Yeah, the and reason why it's important, and Sydney's trying to stress that it's important to make sure the shot is perfect. You want the shot to be perfect every time. And the first buck, when he came in, uh, she'd have stopped him. She might have pulled the shot in a little tighter on his shoulder because he was quartering at her. And so, if you're off the shoulder a few inches, then you got a long recovery after you shoot him. And it's going to you're going to shoot him through the liver and kill him, you know. But it may take him a while to go lay down and die, which is the case. Uh, we left the deer alone for a few hours and came back and literally found him a couple hundred yards away. But he was stone dead. But you know, he obviously went 200 yards, and if she'd have pulled it in a little tighter on that shoulder and put it through that lung, it would have been a quick recovery, might have died on, yeah. on camera, you know. And I'm okay to say that, you know, I shot a little far back. I knew right away when I shot, I was like, that's a liver hit. I liver, I hit him right in the liver, and obviously I want to double lung him every time. That's what I, everybody hopes for, and I shot a little far back, further back. It's a what, woulda, coulda, shoulda deal. Um, and But I knew right away, we pulled out. We didn't even look, pulled out. I was like, we're going to go get food. I mean... He hunched, he was hurting, he didn't like, he didn't know I was there. That's the thing with ruddy bucks too, when they're rutting, they're so like in fight mode that they don't even know what happened. They're like, oh, what the heck? And so he didn't know we were there. We just slowly got out, went and had breakfast. A couple yeah. hours later, we found him and he was yeah. dead as could be. But when we first found him too, I thought, is that an EHD kill? Is that a, that deer dead from EHD? Because we, I, we trailed the deer and she followed it and we split up then because we lost blood and went and looked kind of where he was going. And there was a deer laying in the creek. It was crazy. He was His head was completely under the water. And I, for a minute, I was like, EHD deer down there? And then I get to look and I'm like, oh, no, that's a big antler. That's you, a we don't have that on video, but you you saw me, too, because I'm walking kind of moseying around in a bad <laughs> mood. You know, I'm like, I got to find we're going to find this deer. But where is he at? And I seen him. And I pull up my rangefinder, And I'm like. Is that a rock or a deer? Because I'm looking at the butt end. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and I saw him, and I and I look up at my dad. I can see him on the ridge. He's filming me. I'm like, okay. And then there's Jack losing his mind. This is Jack. We're talking, having a conversation. This is exactly what he does every single time. Yeah, he picks on me. Can't watch TV. Can't talk to Sydney. He's a troublemaker. But man, he's a good little tracker when we need him, aren't you, Jack? Yeah. He's a good boy. He likes to kill squirrels, though. He tries to kill my pets in the yard. I don't like that very much. But <laughs> but anyway, so Sydney made two shots on two big bucks, both of them directly through the river, re, through the <laughs> liver. We, yeah. we recovered them both pretty quick. That was good. And the second buck was a beautiful buck. That was a beautiful, typical five-year-old ten. And uh, we'd seen him before too, so we had history with that deer. That was neat. Yeah. And uh, that was that was that was crazy. And then uh, luckily, I hit. I I had a new farm that uh, we bought, and uh, it was raining one morning, and I hadn't even hung any tree stands in there. Only had a, one trail camera in one location where I actually shot the deer. Had another trail camera. The ironic part of the whole deal was I didn't even know what deer were on that farm. 
And uh, the day that I went in there was kind of like a scouting trip. I went, I still hunted the farm and I never do that too often anymore because of fear of jumping a big deer and chasing him off the farm to the neighbor. So, but that day I, I was skeptical about what kind of deer are, were on the farm and, and got to walking around. It was kind of windy and sleet and rain. And by golly, I spotted that big buck up on a ridge. Uh, he was about two or 300 yards from me. He was pretty good distance and uh, he was courting a doe. So I cut the distance, got in there to about 150 yards of where I'd last seen him. By the time I cut the distance, went down through the autumn olive and snaked my way in with the wind in my face and got set up. I, I had lost track of where he was because he was pushing this girl in and out of the brush. He had a little buck that was giving him uh, problems. And uh, so, but anyway, they had vanished in the thick stuff. So I set up in a you know a good corridor where they might go and they never did show up so once again cracked them horns together and this guy took him about 10 minutes to come down the ridge but when he stepped out holy cow that was uh when you when you rattle a 200 inch deer in and he's coming in posturing and making his way in for the shot there's nothing like it and uh we're not going to let you see the kill here, but we'll show you right up to that moment that I was at full draw. Well, there wasn't no liver punching or anything on him. He gave it up, walked into 15 yards, broadside. The, the crazy part was, though, when I came to full draw on that buck, he was right behind an autumn olive tree and I was on a, in, the, in the bottom of a valley so the wind was swirling in that storm that we were having. And I, I could tell at one moment when he got behind this bush, he caught a little bit of my odor. And, uh, but I had a clear shot at his vitals and I'm aiming at him but right behind me I had Steve there with the camera and I know, you know, you only shoot a 200 inch or every now and in again in your lifetime. You're lucky to get a few of them, you know, and lucky to get one, I guess. So I was like, man, we got to get this on film. But I could tell this deer's getting nervous, but I'm like, man, if you just take three more step, steps, we'll have it. And by golly, he wagged his tail once and stepped right in the kill zone. And then when he got right in the kill zone, right in the open where I knew Steve had him on camera, he stopped. And I'm like, man, this can't be any more perfect. And then all of a sudden he turned and looked right at me. And when he looked at me, I'd already anchored in on his knuckle. And I thought to myself, if ever you miss a shot, don't let it be this one. And I let her eat. <laughs> and it just... Uh, it smoked him, and, and then the only crazy, the another crazy part of the whole situation was there was one gap where Steve could film, and that deer turned and ran right down that gap and ran right straight up the hill. And the, probably the beauty of the whole thing was he ran straight up the hill, and how he made it a hundred yards where he hit is beyond me because I put a grim reaper right through the gizzard, man, and he ran straight uphill and died on a logging road right at the top of the hill where I could drive up to him. And pick him up it was awesome it was what a thrill man he was a mega that's oh, yeah. a mega louie we call yeah we got did. little louie we got big louie got mega louie yeah and then the, the ironic part about it was i checked my stealth cameras you know a few days later and there he is man he's walking around right in front of my trail camera one was a half mile away and then one was within a few hundred yards of where you know we had uh where we where i killed him and uh, so it was pretty, you know, usually it goes the other way around. Everybody checks their trail camera. They, oh, there's a big one. I'm going to hunt that area. But this was like in backwards order. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a great story. It was exciting. It's what we live for if you're, you're a whitetail hunter. And uh, man, it was, it was a thrill. That was the first buck taken off that property. Yeah, yeah. First buck. Could you imagine? Didn't know he existed. Yeah. And yeah. then now we're all like, holy crap. Yeah. 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 So Sydney and I, Sydney you know. Uh, bought this farm just because of the genetics in that area. We've always wanted a farm in that area. And uh, it came up for auction and, and uh, we pooled our, our money together and, and put some money down on it and uh, got this little farm in the middle of the big section of timber. And you know, that's really important. If you know, if you can 
If you can only, uh, you know, if you can only afford a little 30 acre piece of timber somewhere or, you know, I've always said I'd rather have a thousand one acre farms than one 1000 acre farm and put them all in the woods where there's big timber. And this little farm that we have is 80 acres and half of it's tillable um, is right in the middle of a section of big forest, you know, with big uh, wet creeks that flow through it. A lot of Indian artifacts there, so there's you know been whitetails there for thousands of years, and uh, the genetics are strong, a good diversity of habitat, so there's no inbreeding. There's plenty of travel for the big bucks to move up and down, and they're just big, long tined, heavy mass, big you know when they're three year olds they look like shooters and you know so when you kill a five year old or a six year old like in this case maybe seven because he didn't have any teeth you know uh they're giants and so i know shooter killed this deer and days later sydney went in there and set up on a food plot that we have now we did know there was a big 10 pointer there because we had checked our trail camera days before she hit the horns and in a matter of uh you know time somebody come walking right in the food plot with his ears laid back and she got her second deer. So we got lucky when we bought that farm. It's a good one. We got super lucky. And, and that just shows a different caliber because my first buck was probably an eight, seven, eight year old deer. Don't you think the first buck? Yeah, he was, he was pretty old. much. So obviously this area that we're hunting is not had much pressure on it because these deer are dying old there. And one of the neighbors had a bunch of dead heads on, you know, in his garage that he showed me. And, and I was looking at their, uh, their teeth and they, several of them were dead from age. You know, they were just old men that died. Yeah. Uh, there were some EHD uh, heads in there. But, man, when you find a farm like that where there's not a lot of hunting pressure and the neighbors don't hunt much or they're strictly gun hunters, uh, that's, that's the farm you want to invest in. When everybody bow hunts around the farm and there's a bunch of little, you know, 50 to 100 acre plots around the farm that you're looking at, be very leery because the more hunters you stack against you, the less likely you are to consistently shoot big whitetails on that farm. That's like reminds me of one of our, our buddies. He shoots big whitetails year after year. And I think there was one year he shot, you know, he shot, he usually always shoots both of his deer. But he has like an eight acre, I'm talking about Ty, he has like an eight oh, yeah. acre, a little slip, a little sl sliver Ty of timber. Ty Anderson, the guy's a killer. Yeah. yeah. So Ty's, I'm Every sure year. his neighbor hates him, but he's got, he's, you know, he's got that timber. He's got a little pinch point right in the middle of big timber where the deer travel and he's patient. And he only hunts the right wind, and somehow every year during the rut he'll kill one at least, and sometimes he gets two. Big Louie's just chasing a girl right in that place. So. Yeah, yeah. So where? Okay, so he, everybody wants to know where should you be when it comes to the rut? Where should you be on the in the woods? Well, you know, the rut is. Uh, it seems like that's the time that everybody wants to be in the timber, and uh, it can be a really really tough time of the year to, to be in the timber because a big buck will lock down or he will stick in his area where there's a hot doe. But one thing that I, I, I try to stress with people, if you're looking for a buck that's ruddy, you know, even if you got a trail picture of a big deer uh, in August, for example, or maybe even July, if you consistently got him there, but come October, he's vanished on you, unless you've had EHD in your area, you know, you can pretty much assume that that deer is still alive, especially if he's a big guy, because the neighbors would be talking if they got him. So if you're not picking up, you know, on your trail cameras, or perhaps you don't even use trail cameras, go back to that area where you initially saw that big deer because a big buck, he will work his entire home range area during the rut until he finds that girl that he's gonna push her into an area where, where he can keep her to himself. That may be out in the middle of a cornfield in a little waterway, or it may be in a 30 acre thicket you know, where he feels comfortable with that girl that he can hold her to himself. But if you can't find a big buck on your trail cameras in, in the, during the, the rut, you know, don't let that defeat you. Go back to the last location or the consistent location that you saw that big deer and think about the pinch points and the thickets there. Anywhere there's a bedding area close to that location where you've last seen that deer, even if it's in July, 
go hunt the downwind edge of that thicket. And the odds are, if you put in two or three days in that area, if that buck's in between hot does, he's going to cruise that area and look for a girl. And he's going to go downwind of it, and he's going to smell. And if you know you catch him in the right attitude, you might be able to hit the horns and draw him right in. So how, that, long, how long do you think that hitting the antlers together actually works? You know, the closer you get, the closer you get to pre-rut is the best time. So the further you get into the rut, the less the odds are that you're going to drag a big buck into you. Now, right here in Illinois, uh, in Iowa, uh, Indiana, parts of Ohio, you know, right around uh, Halloween. That's when bucks are cruising a little bit. Uh, they're very territorial then. So that's uh, uh, their species, uh, you know, that's the point where they, they say, hey, I'm a mature buck. You're going to, you know, succumb to my fighting if, you know, stick in my area. Or that's when two big bucks clash, you know, because they're trying to be dominant in that area. And uh, so that, but by the, by the third or fourth of uh, November, that subsides quickly. And you'll start to notice by the fourth or fifth that no longer are your scrapes getting hit because that part of the rut is, is coming to an end. Now we're in the full blown rut. The big boys have established, this is my turf and I'm going to rut right here. You stay over there on your side of the, the rutting area. That's why a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are really perplexed why they can't hold more than you know a certain amount of big bucks on their on their farm and that's because you can't stack big bucks you can grow and mature them but your farm can only hold so many big bucks you know you can pass all the three-year-olds you want but if you only own 25 acres you're you're going to be lucky to have a four-year-old or a five-year-old that stays on that 25 acres. You'd be, be lucky to have one because they just, you know, two big bucks, if they get into it and one's dominant and uh, they, get, they get into a scuff, one of them will leave the area or go to the far side to avoid the other guy that's dominant during the rut. So the more country you've got to hunt, obviously the more big bucks you can hold, but, you know, Mathematically, if it's not straight all timber, like a hundred acre piece, if, if it's only a third of its you know, brush and timber and the rest is fields, you'll be lucky to hold two big bucks on it and probably only hold one, you know, big mature deer like what we've shot this year. You know, so that's why if you're, a, if you're gonna rattle or you know, you're, you're gonna hunt your farm, you wanna, you know, you wanna be cognizant of what you're holding on there and, and understand that you know the chances of uh you know killing more than one big buck is, is is slim unless you're in a pinch point where they're crossing and heading from point a to point b and going through your property and that's why come you know halloween if you hit the horns together during that period where they're both competing with each other or different bucks are competing they'll cross the boundaries to come see who's fighting or come to engage that combatant that they're you know equally matched with they'll come over there and that's why we've killed a lot of big deer in our lifetime just you know using the tools of the the rattling horns now by the time your viewers uh you know watch this podcast it will be too late but uh you know in oklahoma it won't it'll still be time to hit the horns in southern kansas and texas and so forth but in the midwest that period is past and same with the the decoy well, no, not the, decoy? Some, the decoy works really good, uh, you know, in that period as well, because they're cruising and yes, they will fight, but dominant bucks protect their turf, even where they feed, you know, they may not run the other bucks out, but they will walk up to them if they can't, under, if they see a buck in their food, if they're, you're in a foot of snow and there's, there's uh, soybeans, you know, that they're feeding on. You'll see the old bucks lay their ears back and they'll posture up a little bit when they walk up to a deer and he'll move out of the way and they'll go on about his way. You put a decoy in a food source, let's say you're hunting a big uh, cornfield and you're not sure where the deer are going to come out, you stick that decoy out there, sometimes a buck will walk, you know, 150 yards just to see who it is and then he'll lay his ear back and come over to him to greet him you know like hey I'm dominant here you need to know about this so Melissa Bachman she's probably one of the best decoy hunters I've ever met 
and every year she consistently shoots a big deer, you know, with her decoy. And she will log hours upon hours in ground blinds just waiting and putting her decoy out in a real highly visible location. Or she'll use it even where they're feeding in late winter, you know, she'll put it out there just to draw those mature deer in there. And um, I, I suspect she shot a dozen big bucks over decoys. And then so for the decoy, let's talk about the wind because you want to play the wind when you put out a decoy because they're typically going to go downwind to get that scent. Absolutely. So if you're going to you're going to pigeonhole yourself, if you put that decoy too far downwind, you're never going to get a shot because he's going to catch the wind before. That's right. So you want to always envision that, you know, if you had the ability to smell breakfast and you, that's the only way you could tell if it's any good, you're going to swing where you can get a sniff of it. And then big bucks, they use their best sense, which is their smell. They see the decoy and then they, they immediately instinctively begin to swing downwind to identify who they're looking at. Because they can smell the decoy uh, or they can smell another buck and they instantly know, oh, that's Junior, you know, Roscoe, how I met him three years ago over on the other farm, wonder why he's here. But when they see the decoy, they go downwind of it. And, you know, unless you're really good at hiding your scent, which I'm not, uh, when they get downwind, they usually are become alarmed and run from the decoy. Uh, you know, but if you're really good at hiding your scent, you know, you put a cover, you put some dead downwind on it or something. So you cover your scent, uh, that helps a lot. But if you handle it a little bit or you brush up against it on your head and get a little human oil on that decoy while you're carrying it out or to and fro, uh, you, you know, that buck will pick up on it. And, uh, so what I do is I place the decoy. Uh, usually about 50 yards from where I'm hunting and I put him directly upwind of me and I envision, you know, if the deer's 10 yards downwind of the decoy, where will that put him? Or if he's 30 yards downwind, where will that put him? And I try to place it so that it puts the deer when he's coming to smell my decoy right in the, the kill zone. And, uh, you know, I haven't shot very many bucks that way because I don't use a decoy enough, but your mom shot them with me. And One of the best videos, I think, is the over -sh shoulder shot that you filmed my mom, Carrie, smoke a big buck coming into the decoy. Yeah, that was really fun. I think it was like a six-pack stand that, around there, wasn't that was, it? That was a fun afternoon. That was on the Silco property. Was it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. right out in the wide open, too, in the cut cornfield and... But it was pre-rut and it was a good crossing and never seen that deer before, but he popped out, looked at our decoy and man, that was a beautiful video. That was cool. Yeah. My favorite place to hunt during the rut uh, that I've, from my experience, my favorite place is definitely um, thick timber that is right next to the food plot. Damn. Yeah, I, I love the thick thick cover where you're near a food, food source because the old boys, when they're looking for the girls, the one place they can find them in the evening sometimes, or at least they're used to finding them there, is in the food plot. When you get a pinch point that is my favorite, my favorite place is a pinch point where you're kind of in the timber or you're right on the edge of a food plot, but you know you're at an opening where they're gonna cruise in just to get a look. Yep. They're not gonna go maybe into the food plot, but they're just gonna peek into the food plot where they can see what what's going on. And chances are, if they're not in there, he's gonna cut across the pinch point, go back to the thicket and see if she's hiding from him in the thicket. And I've even seen him do, you know, take the same lap over and over during the day. You know, they may crisscross or you may see one walk through your trail camera and there in 15 minutes later, he walked back through the other direction, you know, and if you, if you, you got to th think about what is happening in this animal's mind. And a lot of times you realize, oh, there's a ticket over here and there's food over here. And this guy's, he's tramping back and forth looking mm -hmm. for a hot dough. And that dough, and that dough is definitely bedded down around the food plot because that doe's probably going to come out unless it's this full-on rut when she's scared to death and she ain't going to food but yeah. that's where i've majority that's where i've mainly killed my big bucks the past couple years yep. is i had a buck come just cruise into the cornfield look and see what's going on shot him i had one on the edge of the th food plot and the thick stuff kind of just doing his thing bullwinkle yeah, yeah. that was it the first time we've seen bullwinkle so when we talk about 
uh, trail cameras, the one buck that I killed, we had one picture of him every year. Yeah. He's a ghost. But we knew kind of where he lived. We knew where he lived, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's the thing about trail cameras, you know, they, uh, they can make it, they can make a, a poor hunter, a better hunter. Uh, and, uh, but if you're really, if you really think you're a great hunter, you know, quit using trail cameras and see how that works out for you. Because back in the day when I didn't use trail cameras or when they were relatively new, it was a, guessing game you know you you would just sometimes you were hunting a place where you didn't know if there were big bucks you were exclusively working off of tracks you know hoping that you could find that big thick fat track that was a little dull on its tips you know looking for a big mature buck and then you're looking around and finding big scrapes and you may hunt for you know two weeks and finally he walks out and he's a big seven point you know or something like that so you know, the trail cameras have revolutionized hunting. Uh, and, and in a good way, you know, that's good. It gives hunters the edge. And, and a lot of guys think it's part of the fun, you know, putting out their trail cameras. But on a bad side of it, uh, it also, I think, has really hurt our age structure because every time a deer hits four years old uh, or three and a half in, in a lot of pe people's cases, they know where that deer's at, you know. So there's no playing the tracks or or playing the odds of where big bucks are drawn. It's strictly, he's on my trail camera, he was there at three o'clock. And the two days before he was there at four o'clock, I'm gonna sit there, you know, I'm gonna hang a stand and wait there. And that's how 90% of your big buck hunters hunt now. And, uh, you know, I believe that trail cameras have made us, as a general population of hunters, worse hunters than we used to be. Because we do that too. Yeah, we do it because it's so easy, you know. Uh, Especially late season. I would be happy, you know, one of my biggest, uh, you know, sponsors is a trail camera company, you know, and I'll t I'm the first one to say that is the biggest tool, easiest tool to kill big bucks. But if they made it illegal in Illinois next year, I would be okay with that because I know that if they took trail cameras out of the mix for hunting big bucks, we will end up with more big bucks because they will be extremely hard to kill as they already are. And if we can take all the cameras away from all the Drury's and whoever else are out there, are really good hunting, just ask them firsthand, how easy is it gonna be for you to kill big bucks if you don't have a trail camera? And they're gonna tell you, it's gonna to get tough because those deer are smart, hard to kill. And then, uh, you know, it's like anything. It, it, what if they allowed us to use a drone, you know, a thermal drone to find our animals? They make that legal next. What if they make that legal? Okay, well, I fly the drone, you know, you know, an hour for first light. Oh, there's a big buck. He's bedded on this ridge. Chances are he's gonna come, you know, how far are we gonna go? You know, giving everybody the edge. We already have bow and arrows now that we can feel comfortable shooting 55, 60 yards and killing a big buck. You know, and we have, you know, we have all these different tools. When I was first killing my big deer, you know, I was killing them off the ground, hiding behind a tree and waiting for him to come around the corner, you know. No, you know, I wasn't in a beautiful ladder stand. You know, I didn't have trail cameras. The first trail camera I ever used was one that my grandpa invented that had a string that he put down to the ground and put it across the trail. And the, you're excited to see a doe's butt on that thing, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Times are different, and if you're wondering why there's not as many big bucks as there used to be, one reason why is most of them get killed when they're four years old because everybody's got a trail camera on every crossing on every farm. And they're not really as smart when they're four year old as they are when they're six and seven. Mm -hmm. But getting them to that six and seven is difficult. Probably why I shot that big six year old, seven year old, you know, the other day, because he lived where no one was allowed to hunt until I bought the farm. You know, and just by chance, he heard a rattle and he came in to protect his turf. No one had ever rattled to him before, you know, and I killed him. So it's just, uh, that's, that's the way it is now. And as long as we can use trail cameras, we're going to use them. But, um, you know, just like Illinois, they introduced, uh, now this year you can shoot them with a rifle. You know, that breaks my heart, you know, because yeah. now you can shoot a deer with a rifle and I know that's going to, you know, that's going to hurt the age structure. And uh, we're always looking for an edge over the animal that we hunt. And that's why I like primitive weapons and primitive hunting. And, you know, 
I, I like the way it used to be. You know, now, uh, you know, Sydney can bring one of her friends down and in two hours we'll have them trained how to shoot a bow and uh, four hours later they shoot a doe out of a tree stand. That never happened when I was young, you know. You had a bow, when, when I was uh, 20 years old, you, you, I, could have, I had the best bow on the market at the time, it was a PSE. And everybody was raving because it shot 185 feet per second. You know, that was a big deal. You had a big, long aluminum arrow with a big fixed broadhead and uh, you shot off a little rest there and you had a, a pin you could screw in the side of your bow and look down that pin if you wanted to use a sight. I didn't use sights, but that's kind of the sights that they had. And we had about, you know, th three or four deer per square mile, but, you know, compared to what we have now, but it was hard, but man, it was fun. And when you got one, it was something, you know? My first buck was a button buck. I killed him with a Fred Bear recurve when I was seven year, or 11 years old. And, you know, that was the biggest buck, you know, in my mind that will stick with me the rest of my life. And it, to this day is the greatest deer I ever killed. You know, I can still see that old wooden arrow going across the soybeans and hitting that deer and it arced about like that. And it only went about 18 <laughs> yards, but I got him. And, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of how I feel about hunting and where it's gone and where it'll be. And because it's so easy with the weapons that we use and the tools that we use to find them and the scents that we use and the stuff we put on our body so they can't sm smell us, every other hunter in the world now has a big box blind that sits right in their buck forage oats or all their, their clover or their 10 seeds that they got on the ground that the deer can't resist. It's scent free. They're in there and you see the TV personalities now. They're sitting in these big blinds. They're like a house. They're talking to each other and the deer's 25 yards outside the window. You know, and they're like, okay, roll tape. Now we're cutting the video and he's opening the window and shooting the deer. It's like, you know, how far are we gonna take this dang thing? You know, it's like, that's why I make you sit in a dang tree stand, you know? Yeah, even when it's negative 25 yeah, degrees out. Yeah, that's why you have to, you know, part of the time you have to hunt from the ground. And, and that's why you hunt turkeys behind a tree sometimes because that's what makes a great hunter a great hunter. And uh, you have to, at some point, if you wanna be a great hunter, if you wanna know, you know, the instinct of hunting and the thrill of, you know, cutting the distance and being so close you can smell their breath, you gotta forget about some of the edges and you gotta give it back to the animal. And uh, once you learn how to trick that animal uh, without using all the, the edges against him and you still can do it, that's when you become a great hunter. That's kind of like the, I feel like it reminds me of the boys in Arkansas when they can, on public land, public waters, they actually get the, the, yeah, the ducks did. to land. They're like, we beat them. We did it. Yeah, yeah. They did it, you know, on the animal's terms, you know. So, yeah, I always, you, you know, you, you want fair chase. Everybody says, well, I want fair chase. Well, just because it's legal and you got it done doesn't mean it was fair, you know. His phone's gone off. Your phone's gone off about a million times. Mr. Trump, can I call you right back? Thank you. All right. <laughs> That's probably why you didn't let me use a rangefinder until I was like 16 years old. <laughs> yeah, you didn't need that dang rangefinder. And a good way to range find without a rangefinder, I've always told Sydney and all my friends when they're confused, you know, look at the animal, pick the halfway point. And by golly, once you figure out how to do that and then you double it, you're usually within a yard or two. I missed so many deer when I didn't have a rangefinder. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you, you you can do it pretty good now. Though. I can do it pretty good. It definitely trained me. And now it's like we have practiced that way too. But I do like to use my rangefinder. Well, on a big white tail, you should never have to use a rangefinder. Because if he's so far that your bow's not shooting flat to him, he's too far to shoot at anyway. I, yeah, 100%. You know, definitely. if he's under 35, 40 yards, you're going to guess close enough that even if you're off, you're only going to be that way too much high or too low. Yeah, we don't really shoot whitetails unless they're 45 and under. I did shoot my one at 55, but I felt pretty confident. And you, was, you had already ranged that before, though. You knew. Yeah, where, where. I, I always range the whole perimeter. I'd pick, you know, big spots in the middle of the food plot or the timber, range them. Yep. And then I have a kind of, you know, a good idea. Okay, if he's going to haul butt and stop for a millisecond, yep. I don't have to range him. Then I lose my chance. Yeah. That's so. why I love instinctive hunting. You know, I don't have to even, I don't even think about the distance when I draw my bow. You know, I just let the, let my mind take over.
but yeah, that's, you know, I miss deer shoot over them and under them occasionally or coyotes, whatever. But you know, most of the time I can get it pretty, pretty dang close to where I need it to be. But I don't take the shots I used to when I was younger. I'm not as good a shot. You know, I don't, I don't shoot at our big deer over, you know, 45 yards. I won't do that anymore. Uh, you know, if I'm coyote hunting in Mexico or I'm hunting desert bighorn or whatever, I may, you know, stretch the distance and shoot them. But, um, you know, I'll, be, I'll practice more before I go. But whitetails, uh, I feel the same way everybody watching this, for the most part, who has ever hunted whitetails hard or spent their money and time on land or leases. And, you know, when you do get the chance, you sure don't want to make a bad hit. And uh, that comes down to, you know, don't take that shot till the shot's right. Yeah, so the rut is our favorite time of the year. I'm pretty sad. I mean, I'm super happy. I'm not trying to be greedy because I'm pumped. But it's sad. Deer, hunt, deer hunting is well, my yeah, favorite thing Well, yeah, because you're on our world. group text. We're saying, hey, man, I got big look. He's standing in front of me. Oh, my gosh. Or we just got a picture of a giant eight. We'll throw that up on there. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm not, I can't even hunt him. He's so, a big eight. He's big. He's a He's a heart stopper, I'll tell you that. Well, now you get to go to Missouri and you're going to hunt with my buddies over there, Kevin and uh, John and some of the other guys. Mike Miller, he's got a bunch of ground over there that's just uh, always been good turkey hunting. Never have had the chance to deer hunt it with him, but this year you get to go over there and do it. And, do it. and if I kill out, I'll uh, head over there and join you. Yeah, I'm excited. So I, uh, the Gregory's, Wyatt and Jay Gregory, they update everybody on social media nonstop day one day two day three day four yeah. they are die hards too so he's over in, they're over in missouri and i've been texting them just excited just jack and i are gonna head out in the truck and see what we can do and hopefully maybe yeah. we'll give another big louie but it's it's exciting my my season's over in illinois my favorite thing about the Ooh. year is deer camp not yeah. just hunt the hunting portion everybody's in town eating breakfast telling stories so that's the thing that i get kind of sad about missing out just because i'm like oh well but i am i have been uh, having the, the camera in yeah. my hands too <laughs> well it'll be fun to go over there and you know virgin country you don't know anything about it other than the boys say there's some big deer in there let's just see how you do yeah that's, you know that's why we and we're in lockdown down mode too now so come the midwest after the you know the about after the six the, the ruts in full swing there's always a girl ovulating somewhere and these big mature bucks will have that girl, you know, first. So, you know, they're going to be locked down over there. You're going to have to get in tight and tr try to find a big buck, you know, where a, a doe dragging by or you, you get lucky. Maybe you'll catch one that's, uh, you know, finishing with one girl and now he goes looking for another, but it's going to be a tough hunt, but we'll see how you do. Yeah. Like I said, it's the 10th. So this is the week, the next 10 days. My favorite time of the year is usually Thanksgiving time. His favorite time of the year is Halloween. Yeah. So we flip flopped a little bit. Yeah. But this is the best time of the year. So everybody, by the time you're listening to this, it's going to be the 14th or something like that. Get out on a tree stand that weekend because that's going to be money. Yeah. And this has been the most glorious week ever, though, because of uh, the election results. Man, what a, what an exciting night that was after a big hunt. We came back and watch things progress about four or five o'clock, started getting a feel for that. We actually were in the running. I'd already given up on the idea of winning. I was just when as hope Trump gets in the running, you know, I wanted him to win, but I was worried about cheating and everything else. But by golly, we were hanging in there. And then uh, about two in the morning, my buddy calls me, Mike Foster, and says, we won, buddy, we won. And I was, I, I thought I was dreaming, but then the next thing I know, we had won the election. I go running in and woke Sydney up. You're not going to believe this. The red wave. Oh, my gosh. That was awesome. I was so excited. We were so happy. It's yeah. very exciting for America. So we're openly happy about that, as anybody else should with any of their views. Don't be afraid to speak up and tell how you feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, Especially in the, you know, the hunting industry, we see our other peers, you know, some of them are, were willing to, uh, you know, say how they felt about the election and others, uh, you know, kept their mouth quiet. You know, they didn't want anyone to know. They were worried it's going to hurt their platform. But I found that in life, you know, if you just, uh, you know, stick to your guns and, uh, you know, ca call it like it is. Uh, win or lose in the end, that's the, the thing you have to do, you know, and that doesn't say that every time you're, you're going to get rewarded for it because sometimes you're going to get punished and, uh, you know, for doing good things. But that's just, you know, you got to man up and, and st st stay your course and stick your ground, you know, stay in the fight because uh, 
you know, that's that's just how you got to be. But no, this is a good year so far. The rut's here. We're excited for everybody out there chasing them, staying safe, wear your safety harness. I always say that. That's the one thing. JP, John Paul Morris was in town. He's our, our family with my cousin yeah. Kelly. And we're always saying, like, you need to wear your safety harness because we've had so many stories of friends who've fallen on a tree. And you need to wear it all the time too. Yeah, I know. I do need to. You know, I, I, I usually have a rope on me around my waist and anchored to the tree because that's how I, I own. A lot of people don't realize that I owned a, a tree trimming company for f four years and I was a climber. Uh, I would top the trees a lot of times before the bucket truck, uh, if the bucket truck couldn't reach those elevations that we need to get. So I was a climber, went up there and I used a harness and uh, it worked so good for me. I still use my harness like that in the trees, but I need to up the ante and, and grab uh, a good harness from, uh, from muddy tree stands or something and use that, I think it would be better, safer. And set you a do better, sometimes. Set a better example for you guys that are watching me uh, be careless. So remember, you know, it's, it's even in the Bible, you know, you're supposed to, like the Bible teaches you, keep, keep your eyes on Jesus, you know, keep your eyes on the Lord, and, but, uh, you know, and not on man. And as people tell you, hey, you know, you wear your safety harness, but uh, that's a good good thing to follow. Even though you may catch me in a video without one, that don't make it right. So, uh, you know, there's no good excuse for what I've done. So <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. You always wear some kind of rope. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying you don't wear your own makeshift harness. You just need to wear something that's not going to break your arm when you fall out of the tree. Yeah, I probably need to. I, I know one time you were ripping because I had a, uh, I had a dang uh, a bail. Uh, the bale, the, what's the string they put around a bale of hay? Anyway, I had the, that on, on me and that wasn't probably too good. Yeah, I was like, all right, well, you're going to fall and it's just going to snap. Great. Good yeah. luck, or buddy. Or cut me in half. Yeah. Yeah. Man, right. I had a good time talking to everybody today and discussing it with you, Sid, but it's almost time to get back in the woods. And since you got a tag, you don't have a tag no more, you'll just have to wish me good luck. Kill that big eight. Well, thanks for watching, guys. We had a great season so far. It's not over yet. It's still the very beginning. We have December and January, and I got to be behind the camera and watch uh, the rest <laughs> of the world. Maybe Jack will get a chance to hunt. Yeah, maybe Jack behind the camera will be able to shoot his first deer. We're going to start him off with a doe, though. Well, thanks for watching, guys. We, we sure enjoy sharing our stories with you all and giving a little bit of tips and tricks and listening to all the history behind old Timmy over here. He's yep. very interesting when he talks. So Go Trump. Way to go. <laughs> well, we'll see you next time, Barcel Outdoors. Um, this guy. See you later, Jack. <laughs> this guy's a Say menace. Goodbye. As you watch this video, all you see is him attacking us the whole time. You're just crazy. <laughs> all right, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. See you next time, Barcel Outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I agree. <laughs>